Before we conclude, um, I just want to uh, highlight one other thing. Um, on Tuesday this week, uh, Ms. Laura Cooper, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, uh, was recognized as the 2023 Samuel J. Heyman Federal Employee of the Year Award winner. Uh, and since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Cooper and her team have led the response by the U.S. and a coalition of some 50 countries to secure critical military aid for Ukraine at an unprecedented pace. Uh, also known as the Oscars of Government Service, the SAMIs are the premier awards and recognition program for federal employees. And so on behalf of the Secretary of Defense and the entire DOD, we want to congratulate Ms. Cooper on this significant professional accomplishment. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your patience. I do have quite a bit to cover today, so thank you in advance. Uh, well, I go through some detailed information here. First of all, let me address the ongoing situation in the Middle East and the Department of Defense response. And then I'll discuss the reports of drone attacks against U.S. facilities in Iraq and Syria. Uh, as you are all aware, Secretary Austin recently directed several steps to strengthen DOD posture in the region to bolster regional deterrence efforts to include deploying the USS Ford Carrier Strike Group to the Eastern Mediterranean along with the USS Eisenhower currently underway and en route. Additionally, we are also enhancing our fighter aircraft presence in the Central Command region to provide additional capabilities. By posturing these U.S. naval assets and advanced fighter aircraft in the region, we aim to send a strong message intended to deter a wider conflict to bolster regional stability and, of course, to make it clear that we will protect and defend our national security interests. To that end, the crew of the guided missile destroyer USS Kearney, operating in the Northern Red Sea earlier today, shot down three land attack cruise missiles and several drones that were launched by Houthi forces in Yemen. This action was a demonstration of the integrated air and missile defense architecture that we have built in the Middle East and that we are prepared to utilize whenever necessary to protect our partners and our interests in this important region. There were no casualties to U.S. forces and none that we know of to any civilians on the ground. Information about these engagements is still being processed. Uh, we cannot say for certain what these missiles and drones were targeting, but they were launched from Yemen, heading north along the Red Sea, potentially towards targets in Israel. Our defensive response was one that we would have taken for any similar threat in the region, where we're able to do so against our interest personnel and our partners. This attack may be ongoing, so if we have more information to share, we will. But again, as the Secretary has made clear, we have the capability to defend our broader interests in the region and to deter regional escalation and broader expansion of the conflict that began with Hamas's attack on Israeli civ civilians on October 7th. The crew of the Kearney did just that, and across the force, we will remain vigilant to any other potential threats. And while I'm on the topic of threats, let me provide an update on the reports of several drone attacks against U.S. facilities in Iraq and Syria. Early yesterday morning, Syria time, October 18th, the Atat garrison in Syria was targeted by two drones. U.S. and coalition forces engaged one drone, destroying it, while the other drone impacted the base, resulting in minor injuries to coalition forces. Also, the same morning in Iraq, early warning systems indicated a possible threat approaching the airbase at al-Assad and base personnel sheltered in place as a protective measure. Though no attack occurred, sadly, a U.S. civilian contractor suffered a cardiac episode while sheltering and passed away shortly thereafter. And our deepest sympathies and condolences are with the loved, one, loved ones of the individual who passed away. And as you know, the day before, on October 17th, U.S. military forces defended against three drones near U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq. In western Iraq, at al-Assad Air Base, U.S. forces engaged two drones, destroying one and damaging the second, resulting in minor injuries to coalition forces. Separately, in northern Iraq, U.S. forces engaged and destroyed a drone near Bashir Air Base, resulting in no injuries or damage. And while I'm not going to forecast any potential response to these attacks, I will say that we will take all necessary actions to defend U.S. and coalition forces against any threat. Any response, should one occur, will come at a time and a manner of our choosing. Now, in light of all of this activity, Secretary Austin continues to actively engage with his counterparts and leaders within the Middle East. 
Today, he conducted a series of calls, which included discussions with His Highness President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed of the United Arab Emirates, Amir Sheikh Tamim of Qatar, and Saudi Arabia Minister of Defense Khalid bin Salman al Saud. Secretary Austin also spoke with Israeli Minister of Defense Yav Gallant just a few moments ago. And during these calls, he reiterated U.S. support for Israel's right to defend itself from terrorist attacks and also underscored the importance of safeguarding innocent civilians, both Palestinian and Israeli. He emphasized again that any country or any group thinking about trying to take advantage of the situation in Israel to try to widen the conflict should think twice and not doubt the resolve of the United States. It is our aim to avoid any regional expansion of Israel's conflict with Hamas, but we stand ready and prepared to protect and defend our partners and our interests, and we will act to do so. Readouts of these calls will be posted to the DOD website later today. And with respect to U.S. support to Israel, the first shipments of military aid, including munitions, began arriving in Israel last week and continue to arrive on a near daily basis. This assistance is comprised of capabilities requested by Israel to include precision-guided munitions, such as joint direct attack munitions, small diameter bombs, 155 millimeter artillery ammunition, and other categories of critical equipment. In addition, Iron Dome interceptors from stocks that the United States ha has in country have been quickly provided to Israel. And in the days ahead, we'll be flowing additional Iron Dome interceptors so that Israel has the capabilities they need to, us to sustain their Iron Dome defense systems and protect their ci citizens and cities from rocket attacks. We will leverage several avenues available to us to include our stocks and industry channels that reinforce the United States' unwavering and ironclad support for both the Israeli Defense Forces and the Israeli people. As always, the Department of Defense will continue to support, plan, and undertake these critical missions professionally and with the inherent right to protect our force. And with that, I will be happy to take your questions. We'll start with AP Tarkat. Thank you, General Ryder. Could you also talk about, uh, <coughs> apparently there's a new round of attacks at al-Assad that is occurring either now or has happened today. Uh, do you have any information on that? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Tara. Um, I've seen uh, some reporting on that. Uh, I don't have any details to provide right now, but certainly uh, as more information becomes available, we'll pass that along. And then more generally, as this violence has uh, upticked since the hospital bombing, um, what protection measures are you taking, particularly like for the forces in Entente, where there's been so much activity over the years as fighters have tried to move weapons and people towards <coughs> Hezbollah? Yeah, certainly uh, we take force protection extremely seriously, uh, and we will continue to do so. I'm not going to get into specific force protection me measures other than uh, again, when we have forces in harm's way, we're going to look at all possible uh, efforts to ensure that they uh, remain safe and are able to, to stay focused on their, on their mission. So this is something that we'll continue to monitor. Um, but again, um, th we, we are going to take force protection very seriously. But can you say, like, you've strengthened or taken additional force protection measures? And are you seeing more activity, more drone activity, like, in the last couple of days than you have? you know, for the last few months? Um, we are certainly taking appropriate force protection measures to, to ensure the safety of our troops. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into specifics. Uh, clearly, uh, th this is an uptick in terms of the types of drone activity we've seen uh, in Iraq and Syria. Um, but again, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Hi, sir. This is a sensitive question. There's a lot of talk among uh, special operations veterans that when President Biden went to Israel, he uh, had a picture taken with some service members who look like special operators. Can the Defense Department confirm, be the White House took this picture down, that these were in fact special operators? And if so, are they, uh, is there a policy against having special operators have their uh, picture taken? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I'd, I'd have to refer you to the White House on that. I just don't have any information to provide. Thank you. Let me go here to Dan. And then to uh, thank you, General. Uh, th these attacks in uh, Syria and Iraq, the Pentagon commonly or often uh, ascribes the blame on those two Iranian-backed militias or some similar description. Do you have the sense that's the case here? So we're continuing to assess uh, the, the nature of these attacks, uh, and, and that's something that we'll uh, continue to look very closely at. As you've mentioned, uh, in the past we have seen uh, Iranian-backed militia uh, conduct these types of things, but as of right now, I don't have any specifics to provide. Uh, more broadly related on Iran, do you have any update on 
whether or not you <coughs> see Iran, uh, Iran directly tied to the Hamas attack of October 7th? Um, no. At this point, again, uh, the information that we have does not show uh, a direct connection to the Hamas attacks on October 7th. Uh, as, as it relates to Iran, again, that's something that we'll continue to look closely at. All that to say, we do know, uh, as you've heard others say, that Iran uh, has a significant relationship with Hamas in terms of funding, training, and support. Uh, and so, uh, again, in that regard, they, they certainly uh, bear some responsibility. But again, no direct linkage to these attacks, and we'll continue to keep an eye on that. Let me go to Idris. Just a clarification uh, about the USS Kearney. You said the can't say for certain where or what the missiles were targeting. Can you say it that you? Do you believe that they were targeting the Kearney, or do you believe they were not targeting the Kearney at this point? Again, what I provided at the, at the top right now is uh, is what we know. Uh, again, we'll continue to assess this. Can you talk about what naval assets you have in total in the Eastern Med and Red Sea? I think there was the, the USS Mount Whitney yesterday that went there. How many ships do you have in total in the region right now? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to provide a laydown of, of all of our forces in the region, Idris, other than to say, as you know, that the USS Gerald Ford strike group uh, does remain underway in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, the USS uh, Mesa Verde uh, is in the Mediterranean as well. Um, we've got, as I mentioned at the top, the Eisenhower transiting the Atlantic Ocean right now en route to the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the Carter Hall and the Bataan uh, currently remain underway in the Gulf of Aden. I know there's been some questions about that. And I'm just going to leave it at that for right now. Yes, sir. Earlier today, the State Department issued kind of a worldwide caution alert for Americans abroad. Given what we were talking about, some of these drone attacks and uh, attacks on other U.S. facilities abroad, I'm curious, is there going to be some sort of blanket warning for U.S. service members and their families? Are there any fears that these attacks will be more geared towards U.S. service members, uh, even if not just in the Middle East, but more broadly worldwide? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not tracking any specific threats uh, in that regard. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we do take force protection seriously no matter where uh, we're serving, and so we'll continue to do but that. No general warning like State did. Uh, again, two separate things, right, in terms of State Department and its responsibility to warn U.S. citizens, the U.S. military, by virtue of our mission, wherever we're serving, we're going to take appropriate force protection measures. But I'm not right now aware of any specific threats against U.S. service members and their families, which is what I think you're, you're asking. Megan, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Okay. Let me go to the phone here real quick. Let me go to Gordon Lubold, Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Hey, Pat, um, just two questions. One is on attribution, is there any reason to think that uh, the perpetrators behind these attacks are not what they have been in the past? I know you're still investigating, but I'm just wondering if there's any reason to think there'd be anything different, one. And two, just to clarify, has, was there any um, American aircraft uh, or other property damaged in any of these uh, attacks? I can't remember if you said it specifically or not. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. Uh, so in terms of uh, the attribution for these attacks, again, that's something that we're continuing to look at. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to have any information to provide right now uh, in terms of the impacts of those attacks beyond what I've provided. All right, let me go to um, Rebecca from BBC. Hi, thanks for taking the question. Um, I wondered if you can confirm or you had any comments on these reports that the IDF has the green light to, has been given the green light to enter Gaza. Um, so I, I've obviously seen the, the press reports on that. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, as, as it relates to IDF operations, I would refer you to them uh, to, to talk about their operations. Thank you. Let me go to Courtney. Um, the, the American or the contractor who died of the cardiac event, was he or she an American citizen? I will get back to you on that. And then can you say how many drones were shot down and what kind, and what did the Carney use to shoot down the, the lat, lat, um, cruise missiles and the drones? Please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I don't have any information to provide on the specifics in terms of uh, what system the Carney used to take down. Um, so if we're able to make that information available, we will. Um, and then in terms of the number of drones, I think I kind of laid that out, right? Well, so, yeah, that's about as specific as I can get right now. Okay, and then just one other, I, I think this is Idris's question, but I may be wrong. You said that the, you don't see any direct connection to these, this uptick in these recent attacks and to October 7th, but I wonder if you 
I see any connection to this uptick because it, it, it really this is a, a departure from where it's been the past several months. If you see any connection to what's to what's happened after October seventh, so to the fact that the Israelis are talking about a massive ground invasion, they're already doing these airstrikes. Is it tied to that? Potentially? Yeah. So so you know the reality is, Courtney, I, I don't want to. Uh, allow my imagination to fill in the gaps uh, and, and the supposition. Clearly, there are tensions in the region, um, which is why you see us working so hard right now to make sure that we're keeping lines of communication open with regional leaders uh, to make sure that we're sharing information uh, and also for actors in the region uh, to, to understand our message loud and clear about deterrence to pretend, prevent uh, potential miscalculation. Um, again, as we continue to look at this and analyze uh, the the nature of these attacks uh, and uh, attribute these attacks, you know, we'll certainly know more. Um, but that's where we're at right now. In the meantime, again, our focus is going to be continuing to uh, ensure that we are uh, deterring a potential regional, broader regional conflict, as I mentioned, uh, and also continuing to, to work closely with Israel to ensure they have what they need to defend themselves against future terrorist attacks. Fadi. Thank you, General. So uh, when you talked about the interception, you said this is a demonstration of the integrated uh, air and missile defense. Um, were other um, nations or, uh, or parties in the region, um, uh, did they contribute one way or the other to the interception, whether through information, radar? Or what did you mean yeah, by that? Yeah, so Fadi, as you know, I mean, we, we obviously, uh, the United States works with a lot of partners in the region and broadly speaking have integrated air defense capabilities. Um, and so in this particular case, uh, the USS Kearney, as I highlighted, uh, determining this threat was able to take that threat out. And that's about as specific as I can so get. This was in partnership with other... Uh, yeah, I don't <laughs> have any other information okay, on that. And then on the, uh, on the hospital, um, the president, as you know, mentioned the data from the DOD uh, to say Israel wasn't uh, responsible. The IDF used Al Jazeera broadcast to make uh, the case that it was a, a Islamic Jihad. Uh, we did uh, a very detailed investigative uh, report about that based on our broadcasting. Um, the missile that they claimed it was a Jihad missile was actually intercepted uh, seven minutes before the hospital was targeted. Uh, Channel 4, UK, uh, they're saying even though there's not a big uh, great and, uh, and I'm sorry, if, I, if you don't mind, just to get to the question. My, my point is, there's lots of questioning of what the president claimed and what the Israelis are saying, uh, noting that many hospitals have been targeted, civilian and uh, UN facilities by Israel. Are you willing to share the data that you have that the president used? Yeah, uh, so to let's say let's, let's uh, a yeah. couple things here. So first of all, uh, don't conflate. Uh, other reporting and media reporting with where we're necessarily getting our information from, right? And we, we certainly have our own capabilities, uh, some of which does include open source information, um, but we have other capabilities. Uh, and, and, you know, as you know, the White House put out a statement yesterday on this topic. So when it comes to informing our senior leaders, um, we are using our own information to make those assessments. Uh, and as, as you've heard us say right now, based on the information that we have, um, it is our assessment that Israel was not responsible for that, that explosion. Um, we're continuing to assess that. Initial indications are that this was from an errant rocket um, that was launched by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, but again, we're going to continue to assess this. And, and that's where we're at on this particular uh, topic right now. Um, but again, just to, to reassure you, we're not necessarily relying on other reports or media reports to come to those conclusions. That wasn't my question. My question is, is the department, because under international law, this is a war crime, regardless who did it, right? Um, so is the department willing to share the data that it has uh, to... Right now, I'm, I'm sharing with you what we have, and, uh, and that's where we're at. So if we have more to provide, we, we certainly will. But let me... Yes, Laura. Thank you. Um, just some clarifications. Um, in Syria and Iraq, can you say a little bit more about how um, how the, they took out the drones? Um, and then on the Kearney, could you give more specifics on where the intercept took place? Was it over land or over sea? Sure. Uh, so my understanding uh, on the on the latter, uh, and again, you know, we'll have more details uh, potentially in the future here. But my understanding was it was over water. 
Um, as far as the uh, taking out the drones, I'm not going to get into specifics um, other than to say defensive systems on those facilities were able to successfully take those drones mm -hmm. down. So not fighter, not fighter jets this time. Correct, not fighter jets. And then just a broader question. Um, just given all the assets that have been sent to the region for deterrence um, and then given these attacks, is deterrence working? And do you see this as an escalation of the conflict? <coughs> yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And what I would say is uh, it's important, again, take a step back. Now, first of all, these attacks, these small-scale attacks, uh, are clearly concerning and dangerous, right? And we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to do everything necessary to ensure that we're protecting our forces. Uh, and, and if and when we choose to respond, we'll do so that at a time of our choosing. Um, but if you step back and look again at what our broader strategic aim here, which is to deter, to deter a broader regional conflict, which is why you see us putting additional forces into the theater, which gives us more <laughs> options to respond, uh, which is also why you see us continuing to communicate very actively uh, with partners in the region as well as potential uh, actors who might want to try to take advantage of this. So uh, again, right now, uh, this conflict is uh, contained between Israel and Hamas, uh, and we're going to do everything we can to ensure deterrence in the region so that this does not become a broader regional conflict. Let me go to Tony. Yeah, I was going to you can square that circle again. Uh, somebody while listening in on this is going to think the Middle East is on fire now because of the U.S. helping after October 7th. Broadly, you don't see any connection between these Yemen, Syria, and Iraq at this point in terms of Iran directing or some great hand directing the attacks. Uh, again, right now, I think you have to look at these individually. Uh, again, we're taking them seriously and we're responding appropriately, obviously, uh, ensuring that our forces are protected. Uh, but again, our focus is on deterring a broader regional conflict. And right now, uh, this conflict is contained between Israel and Hamas. Uh, and we'll continue to work very closely with partners in the region and allies to ensure that we can maintain deterrence going One forward. Question follow up. What advanced aircraft are you talking about? And where are the Iron Dome interceptors from the United States coming from? Are those those from Army stocks being flown to Israel? Uh, in terms of the uh, interceptor ammunition, um, so, uh, Tony, we'll, we'll have a variety of means available to us to include stocks that are already in Israel. Uh, and so, uh, again, I won't get into specifics on where exactly they're coming from other than we have a variety of, of means to, to do that. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, your first question. You did say, though, they were being flown from the United States, the interceptors. Follow on, Iron Dome interceptors. So I'm just asking, are those the Army stocks? In terms of the am interceptor ammunition. Yes. Same thing, interceptor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, we have a variety of, of sources, both U.S. based and then also coming from within. F 35s, are those not being redeployed to the region? Um, and then, in terms of advanced fighter aircraft, uh, just to, to clarify, in terms of uh, F 16, F 15s, um, right now I don't, I'm not tracking any F 35s to, to read out on, the, on that front. But again, if that changes, we'll let you know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Time for a few more. Yes, sir. You're raising your hand, but you're not looking. Yes, sir. No. Yes, thank you. So I have a couple of questions on Ukraine. So there are reports that the Pentagon plans to send Israel artillery shells that were initially designated for Ukraine. Could you provide any comments on that? Um, I, I don't have any information on that other than to say that, that we are confident we can continue to support both Ukraine and Israel in terms of their defensive needs. Why not attack them? So could you specify how many missiles has the U.S. provided for Ukraine? Are there any conditions on their use in the battlefield? Any or assessment? Will they how will they complement Ukrainian abilities? Sure. Um, so no, I can't get into the specifics in terms of the number of attackums uh, that we provided. But just like all of the other systems and, and equipment that we provided to Ukraine, uh, it is with the assurances that this will be used within uh, sovereign Ukraine uh, to take back and defend sovereign uh, Ukrainian territory. Quick follow-up. So Ukrainian Foreign Minister said that this is not the, the first shipment. There was a commitment to provide Ukra more attack camps for Ukraine in the future. Could you comment on that? I, I don't, again, we're going to continue to consult with Ukraine, our allies and partners, to ensure they have what they need to defend themselves against Russia. Okay, let me just go to the phone here real quick. Jeff Selden, VOA. Thanks very much for doing this. You've spoken a little bit about the military attacks in, in the region, the drone attacks, the missiles launched by the Houthi, but to what extent is the Pentagon worried about some of the non-military or non-militant uh, group activity, like some of the protests that are looking at U.S. targets, embassies, uh, the, you know, the, the bigger concern that maybe there's 
a coordinated push between kinetic means and, 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 and other people pushing buttons to inflame tensions in the region. And then also in the past, the Pentagon has been part of the effort to declassify information to push back against narratives like with Russia. Is the Pentagon pushing for any of the or advocating declassifying information with the bombing at the Al-Ali hospital since the narrative that Israel did bomb the hospital has inflamed tension so much? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So on your latter question, again, uh, as I as I mentioned to uh, Fadi, uh, when and if we have more information to provide on that, we certainly will. I just don't have any additional information at this time. Uh, as it relates to the broader Middle East region uh, and around the world, of course, we always uh, take safety and security of our citizens very seriously. Um, we will continue to stay in close consultation with State Department. Um, it, it is clearly something we're keeping an eye on. We, rec we recognize that there are tensions right now in the Middle East and throughout the broader region. Um, again, I'm not uh, tracking any specific information regarding the, the specific targeting of uh, American citizens or U.S. military forces or their families. Uh, but again, this is something that we will take seriously and, and do whatever we need to do to ensure their safety. Thanks very much. Yep. Why, why did the U.S. Sh shoot down these missiles and drones? Why? What was the, uh, I mean, why, why we, in the Northern Red Sea? Who, who were they protecting? Uh, again, I what I read out of the top is what I've got on that coordinate. I don't, but I don't think you necessarily addressed it. I mean, it's it's pretty uncommon. I think, if I remember correctly, there have been cases of the U.S. intercepting some things in like the Bab el Mandeb, but I don't ever remember them you guys intercepting anything in the Northern Red Sea. So there must have been a reason, something that the, the decision was made to protect. Was it Israel or? Well, again, uh, as, as this missile was detected uh, and the, dis the decision was made uh, that it posed a potential threat uh, based on its flight profile, and so the decision was made to take it down. Potential That's threat to Israel or to the Again, or to this, the is something, this is something we're still assessing. Did Secretary Austin have to, ass um, is that a secretary level decision to do that? Uh, not to my knowledge. So it's the ship's commander? Or? I don't have the specifics in terms of who made that authorization, but clearly uh, we always maintain the inherent right to self-defense. Uh, and so the decision was made to, to uh, take the shot, and they took it. You said potentially inside of Israel earlier, just as, as a clarification, potentially targets inside of Towards Israel. Israel. To, toward, toward Israel. Israel. Toward Israel. Correct. Oh, okay. yep. Was it self-defense? Uh, again, what I had at the top there is what I have to provide. Let me go to Mike. Yeah, I want to uh, ask about the hospital issue again. A lot of outlets are reporting these Hamas figures that it was several hundred victims. Uh, now AFP is coming out saying it was like 30 to 50. I was wondering, did the U.S. have any better idea of actually how many casualties there were from it? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, so the short answer is uh, not yet. That's something that we're, we're looking at. Um, and, and like you, we've seen numbers all over the map. Uh, so that's another aspect that we're looking at right now. Thank you, sir. Thanks, General. Um, on Tuesday, uh, the Pentagon announced that uh, it was giving the sort of ready to deploy order to around 2,000 troops, but that units had not yet been identified. Have any units out of the, those 2,000 rough troops been identified yet? Yes, uh, so we have identified units, um, but what I will tell you is right now we're just not going to go into specifics unless those or those units are actually tasked to deploy, at which time we will be prepared to talk about what those units are. Are you able to at least say whether those units are stateside or OCONUS at the moment? I am not. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Austin has stressed the need to focus on the uh, post-war plan for Gaza war. Uh, President Biden mentioned the mistakes done by the U.S. after 9-11, which uh, could be the invasion of Iraq or the strategies there, I don't know if you agree, um, which caused improvement in Iran's position. Um, and 2,000 uh, forces ready in the Mediterranean, spokesman Kirby told that no intention of to put uh, U.S. boots on the ground. My question is, even though the U.S. tries to limit the damage uh, does the Pentagon assess a big war impact in Iran, uh, Syria, even Turkey, and any preparation of U.S. military presence on the ground in a post-war future scenario in the Middle East again? I'm not sure I understand what you're, you're asking. Uh, the question is, even uh, you are trying to limit the damage, do you assess a big and large war in the Middle East, including Iran, Syria, and oh, Israel? Do we assess a big, a large war? Yes. Uh, that's exactly what we're trying to prevent, right? I mean, that that is uh, the, the United States clearly working with our international allies and partners 
around the world to ensure regional stability and security to prevent regional or prevent conflicts from becoming regional. Uh, and again, um, you know, like like everyone else, uh, all peace and freedom loving countries, uh, we want people to be able to live in peace, security and stability. Uh, and we will continue to stay focused on that. Uh, this is a very unfortunate situation right now uh, that, that we're seeing play out um, as Israel tries to defend itself from Hamas terrorist attacks. And so we'll continue to stand by the people of Israel uh, as they look to defend themselves and their, their country. But certainly uh, when it comes to the broader Middle East, no one wants to see this expand into a broader regional war. And we'll continue to work with our allies and partners to, to prevent that. that. to happen in this case? I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. I think you and I would both agree that we certainly would not want to see that. All right, time for a few more. Yes, sir. Just real quick, I wonder if we can clarify the um, the nature of the minor injuries by uh, coalition personnel sustained in Iraq. And I, I cannot, other than to say, uh, in all cases, they return to duty. Okay. Thank and you. Just a quick follow-up. Um, you mentioned that this conflict is assessed to be currently contained between Israel and Hamas. The um, the attack, attacks on the Assad Air Base uh, were claimed by the Islamic resistance in Iraq, which is an umbrella term for Iran-backed groups in Iraq. Uh, the head of Qatar, Sayyid Shuhada, uh, two weeks ago said that if the Americans intervene in Gaza, uh, the a entire, quote, axis of resistance will intervene and the entire region will catch fire. Hadi al-Amri, head of the Badr organization in Iraq, said that uh, we will consider all Americans legitimate targets if the U.S. intervenes in the Gaza conflict. Uh, Yemen's Houthi leader said a similar comment, saying that his side was in total coordination with other IHJC-backed groups across the region. Does the department really see no connection between the Gaza war and what just happened? Look, again, it's important to separate uh, these attacks from the current situation. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, assess attribution on these. Certainly, rhetoric uh, from hate groups is not a new thing in the region. Um, we're, of course, going to take all of that seriously, but we're also not going to overreact. We're going to continue to do what we need to do to deter conflict. Uh, and ensure uh, regional stability while at the same time supporting Israel. Okay. All right. Uh, last question. <clears throat> Thanks, General. Um, so the State Department has released numbers that about 30, at least 30 American citizens died in the initial Hamas attack in Israel. Do you have any data on whether, you know, how many of those were combatants, like dual citizens fighting with Israel, or how many were just tourists or civil <coughs> U.S. civilians over there? Yeah, I really don't. I don't. And actually, I apologize. Uh, one more from the phone here. Let me go to uh, James uh, from Messenger. Hi, thank you. Um, so if you historically look at any U.S. airstrike um, that accidentally kills um, civilians, even if those civilians are co-located with, with enemy combatants, the U.S. typically takes responsibility for, for that incident. Uh, Israel's position has been that in airstrikes in Gaza, it is not their fault that innocent civilians have been killed. In fact, it's the fault of Hamas. And, and I'm wondering where the U.S. stands on that position that Israel is taking. Yeah, thanks, James. So I'm, I'm not going to speak for Israel. Uh, you, you know, I will say, and, and you've heard Secretary Austin say this, uh, that uh, Israel is a professional military. It's professionally led. Uh, but this is something that we have been communicating actively um, both publicly and privately in terms of the importance of ensuring, uh, and, and as I mentioned in my topper, safeguarding civilians, both Palestinian uh, and Israeli, uh, as, as these operations are planned. And so that will continue to be our position. Thank you. Um, I don't have any specifics uh, to provide for you. If, if your question is, do we have special operations forces conducting, you know, boots on the ground operations? Again, you've heard us say uh, that we are not going to have, uh, you know, boots on the ground. Uh, but uh, I don't have anything. We are we are providing um, planning and intelligence support to the Israelis uh, as it pertains to hostage recovery. Um, that's about the extent of, of what I'm able to provide right now. Hey, before, I'm sorry, before we conclude, um, I just want to uh, highlight one other thing. Um, on Tuesday this week, uh, Ms. Laura Cooper, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, uh, was recognized as the 2023 Samuel J. Heyman Federal Employee of the Year Award winner. Uh, and since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Cooper and her team have led the response by the U.S. and a coalition of some 50 countries to secure critical military aid for Ukraine at an unprecedented pace. 
Uh, also known as the Oscars of Government Service, the SAMIs are the premier awards and recognition program for federal employees. And so on behalf of the Secretary of Defense and the entire DOD, we want to congratulate Ms. Cooper on this significant professional accomplishment. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.